And good morning. I'm singing along with the song. I'm do wanting along with it. That's a great song. Love it, love it, love it. Good morning, good morning, and good morning. It's good to see everybody up this morning. Up early and going. I don't, well, it didn't seem to be too terribly cold out there this morning when I was out earlier. I pray you are doing well, each of you. And Miss Betsy, you are first up this morning, and we give you a wave out. I like the little waving hand out there. Good morning. Well, little body. You know, at any rate, Miss Terry, we love you too. Hope you are rested up, my friend. I really do, and I just just keep bumping the, the, the buttons, don't I? There we go. I'll try to move that out of the way. Uh, Rick, good morning to you, sir. It is good to see you right along with your precious wife, Miss Lena, and our Carolyn. Good morning, Carolyn. I'm going to be working with you again on a couple of weeks, so I am thrilled about that. 24th, uh, Carolyn will be, uh, of course, uh, Isaac's going to be out of country, <laughs> not just out of town, but out of country. So uh, Carolyn's stepping up. God bless. She'll be on the piano, and I'll be waving my whatever it is that I wave, you know, and uh, we'll be there. Daniel, good morning to you. I don't know if you're home or at work. If you're at home, big hug and kisses to everybody there in your orbit. If not, when you get home, give that to them. There's your mom. There's Miss Debbie. Good morning to you. Love the hearts, and we love you. Anxious to see you back on the 24th. We're going to have to go well, man. It'll work it. So be careful at work. Miss Alyssa, good morning to you. By the way, uh... Uh, Kara, how'd the testing go? Did you get it all done? Did you go, Shh, it's over? Sweet, sweet young lady. Yes, she is. So good morning, Miss Kara. Good morning, Miss Alyssa. It's good to see you. Uh, big shout out. Big, big, big love to your hubby. I know he works on Sunday, most Sundays, but miss seeing him. He's a great, great guy. So good morning, Miss, uh, Mr. Cameron. You have a a, a great day, and uh, along with Mr. Cody, I bet you guys just team up together to do really nice things for your mom and your grandma, Miss Sue, who is here for a month. It is good to have you all with. Uh, all of you that are out there, we'll give shout-outs to others as they sign in. I pray you're doing well. <clears throat> I spent until uh, a little later last night. My voices were raw because I taped... Uh, uh, a couple uh, of our lessons, well, not in Mark, because I didn't know where we'd finish in Mark. So you've got a couple of special lessons out there dealing with uh, becoming or what it takes to become uh, Christ-like in our character and what that means and what kind of character traits do we want you know, in our lives? How do we want to be defined and known? Uh, the lesson tonight will deal with uh, missions and this same three theme. You know, knowing who we are determines what our mission is. And mission always points to who we are. Uh, our mission in life uh, is going to grow out of personhood, out of who we are. And personhood needs to be based upon and grown out of a firm and wonderful foundation. So that gives you kind of a, a preview of uh, uh, tonight and, and, and Thursday, Friday, carrying on that same uh, theme of character. We're going to look at a particular character trait and what it took for a particular individual to develop or how we see it's developed in the life of that individual. So I, I pray he'll plug in, even though I won't be live, I'll be taped. Hopefully I can plug in uh, uh, from Louisiana, at least say hi to everybody. So I look forward to seeing you out there and, uh, you know, pray for us. We'll uh, head out later this evening to the airport uh, because we, you know, we have an early, early flight. We usually go and stay out there, park our car out there. Uh, it's cheaper that way. Uh, you usually can get a room and, and park your car for a week for what it takes to park in a parking lot. but And then we shuttle over in the morning. We leave very early in the morning, flying into Atlanta, 
And then from Atlanta, we pick up our flight to Monroe. We're meeting Julia in Atlanta. She's on the same flight. So uh, who knows? Maybe by, by happenstance, circumstance, God working things out, we'll even be in the same road together or close enough that we can visit even on the plane. Uh, but uh, just looking forward to what God's going to do. Uh, what a blessing. You know, that's going to be Friday morning. We're meeting at the church, going over, you know, getting things set up and looking at it. So, uh, you know, it's not a sightseeing trip, but uh, it's going to be a good day. Then Saturday is the memorial service and Sunday. Then we'll be winging our way back uh, through Dallas this time and up. Well, we love you. That kind of gives you our itinerary. Please continue to pray for us. Miss Teresa has come on, and we give her a shout out. Good morning. And my sweet wife is out there. Good morning, dear brothers and sisters. You, uh, you love through Christ. Your love through Christ keeps me every morning. Miss Brenda. Let's see. Good morning. The bees are here. Brenda and Brent. Great. Such good friends. I have been blessed because God brings friends like that into our life. And right under them is Miss Therese. Good morning, Miss Therese. All right. Good to see you. That's my bonnet gal. I just I just love uh, the 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 head headdresses that she wears. It just that that's that's her bark, I'll tell you. What a sweet lady. Anyway, let's move out. Uh, let's begin um, kind of where we picked up, but I want to flesh that out a little bit too this morning. Uh, we were looking at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, okay? We've come to that point. Uh, and uh, here at, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, or, you know, uh, you know, the beginning of that with the Passover, it'll be here that Jesus is going to bomb the bombshell that one of you will betray him. Uh, Teresa, uh, Terry says, coming through DFW is always an interesting experience. Yes, it is. But going through Atlanta is equally an e experience. To, to both of them are huge airports. And, uh, you know, coming through them can be, you know, really interesting. Uh, <clears throat> so we begin at the beginning. In verse 12 of Mark 4, uh, Mark writes, on the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? Now that's what we looked at yesterday, is it not? That how Peter and John went out, found the guy carrying the, the water pot. Uh, I, I, I think uh, uh, this has to, you know, God has set something up. This is a stealth movement in my heart, in my imagination. Knowing what Judas has done, he's already gone out to betray him already. He's already uh, got the money in his pocket. He's looking for an opportunity, but he's not going to get the opportunity before the Passover. And uh, see, he probably doesn't know where it's going to be until the last moment. And there they meet in that upper room. And we talked about the, the seating arrangements, and it's uh, obvious by the, the, the descriptions given us in the Gospels, all four of them, that on one side of Jesus lounging at the table is John the Beloved. At the other side of him, close enough you know, to his elbow to dip into the same cup, is Judas Iscariot, who will betray him. Uh, I, I'd like to stop there and, and pray and launch it because I want to give you kind of an understanding of this week, uh, of the feast, uh, the festival of unleavened bread, what it stands for, what it's looking at, what it means, and, and if it has a meaning to us. In fact, it does, and it would be, we've done it before. Well, I'm not going to go into that now. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you so much for this morning and for your word. And I pray, Lord, that you will build within each that listen an excitement, a, 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 uh, a deep enthusiasm, entheos, uh, 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 passion that comes from, from our theos, our God, uh, for your word and what is in here. That, God, we can strip away the layers of our, our uh, lack of knowledge and see deeply into your word, looking into the cultural perspective, seeing if it has any application to us. God, I am so thrilled to be here this morning, so 
incredibly overwhelmed by the privilege that you give to me to be able to open the word and share that word with, with, with folks. Get their feedback, and I want them to be engaged, Lord. So I pray that you will engage each and every one of them. God, you are magnificent and wonderful. Now, we give this time to you as a time of, of, of worship and a time of launching our worship today so that as we close out and we go out, everything we do today will be an exercise in worship. In all things, let us give glory to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Sorry, every once in a while, especially in this right hand, it's like somebody takes a, a something and and pinches a nerve and, and twists the nerve there in my thumb or in my wrist. So, uh, sorry about the flinch. Uh, I'll try to be better about not doing that. Uh, the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread I've shared with you before are not the same thing. Uh, although many think they are today, uh, and even many Jews represent them as being the same thing. They really are not. They're, they describe two separate feasts in the Bible. The fact that they come right on the, the heels one to another uh, makes that, whoa! Oh, boy, I'll tell you what, boom, ba -doom, boom, boom, uh, boom. There's Mr. Angie Green. Angie, Angie, Angie. God love you. Uh, that's kind of a, a surrogate uh, a grandchild, if you will. Uh, Angie Green. Oh, I love you, girl. It's good to see you out there. Miss Linda, good morning. Much love to you, Miss Linda, my precious friend. Miss Jessica, good morning to you. Big kisses to my sweet Sadie, which is another going to be another surrogate granddaughter. I like these surrogates as well. Miss Angela says, I love listening to my grandpa preach it. It makes me feel like a child again. Well, I hate to tell you this, uh, Angie, you're a child in my heart and always will be. i tell you what, over the years, I, I guess as you get older, and uh, we've spent our, our, our life, most of our married life, and all of Joshua's life, and most of the girls' life, in the ministry. And uh, I've got a lot of, of men and women, I, I, I say kids, but they're all men and women grown up with their own families uh, that are like, been just kind of in our home and raised and they're like our own. And they think of us as a mom or a dad or a grandma or a grandpa. And uh, they stay in contact and it's, it, 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 it warms my heart. Uh, it's kind of like I'm looking out there and seeing Jessica and remembering when I first saw her walk into the doors of the church uh, no higher than my knee. And now she's my secretary. So uh, it got good. That's kind of a wow to me. At any rate, I do wax poetic this morning. I don't know why. It's just one of those mornings. Uh, love you, sweetheart. Proud uh, of the work that you do. Anyway, Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, though they're smashed together in the minds of people, even in the, in the hearts and minds of many Jews today, we need to understand biblically, scripturally, and throughout the, uh, the history of Israel, even up to this point, they are two very distinct and very separate holidays with a intended purpose for both of them. Uh, we, uh, uh, though he ties these together in verse 12, in verse 1, Mark separates them out, does he not? Take a look at Mark 14, 1. Now, <clears throat> the Passover and unleavened bread were two days away. The chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to seize him by stealth and killed him, for they were saying, not during the festival. Otherwise, there might be a riot between the people. So, what festival are they talking about? Obviously, now they're talking about the Feast of Unleavened Bread, because Jesus has Passover with his disciples. And he's betrayed the night after they have the Passover dinner. And uh, he is crucified, you know, after that and and before, on, on that day when the Paschal lamb is being, you know, uh, uh, sacrificed. And, and during the time of the evening sacrifice, he dies. And then it's at twilight that uh, the feast of 
the the unleavened bread begins, and that's the beginning of a Sabbath. All right, both the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread are meaningful celebrations. Our Savior and and what He's done for us can be clearly symbolized in both these feasts. They give such a vivid picture of who He is and why you and I need Him. Uh, we don't want to separate them in, in, in such a way that we, we lose their meaning, but we, we have to understand the events. Uh, again, here's the word I know you all have loved to, you know, learned to love to hate. Context, context, context. We're looking at this in the context of the Jewish culture 2,000 years ago. All right, much of that culture exists today, but there are some things that are distinct that we need to look at. The Passover lamb in Egypt, we know, foreshadows Jesus, our Passover lamb. If you ever have been to a Christian Seder uh, and, and, and read the Haggadah uh, and taken those scriptures with, with view of Christ in mind, you'll see the beauty of Christ laid out in the entire uh, Passover meal from from the uh, from the egg to the bitter herbs to uh, you know to, to the lamb everything <clears throat> and we have uh, not in recent years but in years past we've had the Passover you know in the church and celebrated that Passover had big table up there and a lot of tables I think we must have had uh, ten or twelve tables out there of people sitting around filling those tables up. Uh, we used the deacons and others to be uh, heads of the tables, and, and we went through it as if you were going through it in your own home. Uh, we've had it in our own home, and we've, we practiced it when we were in Arizona. We practiced it when we were in, 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 in Broomfield. It is a gorgeous feast. And just as the blood of the Passover lamb rescued the Hebrew people from slavery, it's the blood of Jesus that saves us from the savory of our own sin. The Passover takes place, you know, we've, we've looked at it, on the 14th day of Nisan. And the Feast of Unleavened Bread starts the very next day on the 15th day of Nisan at twilight. This is a seven-day feast. And the first and the last days our Sabbath days. You got it? Which day of the week they're on changes from year to year. No matter what day it occurs on, whether it's a Friday, a Saturday, a Sunday, Wednesday, doesn't matter. Remember, it rotates differently because we Look at the calendar. Get ourselves in trouble looking at these things, counting days and all these things, because we have a 365-day Julian calendar. But the Hebrew calendar is only 360 days. All right? So they don't coincide day by day. So the command for this feast says that to eat unleavened bread for seven days. To have, you know, whatever they eat, they eat as no leaven in it. And they are to remove all leaven from their life. All leaven from their homes before the feast begins. This is the period where the Feast of Unleavened Bread overlaps with the Passover. And for the next seven days, from the beginning, all meals, all snacks, uh, anything that you are, nothing can contain any leavening agent or leavened products. Leaven, of course, we know represents sin, does it not? In the scripture. So they have to go throughout their house and make sure that they clean everything out and there's no sign of leaven. It's really interesting when Hashanah Rabbah was meeting in the church, uh, a messianic uh, fellowship. And they had the Passover. They went through that kitchen and they, everything was taken out of the cupboards and it was scrubbed and cleaned and to within an inch of it our, our life before they ever started preparing the meal, making sure that they had removed all leaven 
from the kitchen. They didn't do it in the whole church, but they did it in the kitchen. Well, the Feast of Unleavened Bread gives those who participated in it a great picture of sin in their life, and it does for us. As we've done that before. And uh, when we did the Passover, uh, you know, at the church, we would tell people, and we would, you know, to take a, they'd take a spoon, a wooden spoon, and a feather, and to go through the house and, you know, scoop up the dust and get it all in place and, and take it outside and discard it. The idea, since yeast or leaven signifies sin, you know, this is a picture uh, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, of sin in our life and getting it out of our life. In the process of cleaning it out of our homes, we begin to realize very quickly how difficult it is to find and remove all leaven. Now, the challenge is we turn the kids loose and they would have to, you know, they would have to, to just get everything out. Uh, I, I want you to, uh, to think about this for a moment. What would it be like to get every crumb, everything considered leaven, out of every corner and from under every piece of furniture? Out from everywhere you can think of. Well, like in a house like mine, four people and two dogs. Is it even possible to get it all? Well, the hair of the dog itself would be considered unclean and have to be removed. So, you know, can you imagine getting all of that? You know, I want you to think about the impossibility of even finding it all or getting it all. You know, uh, you know, getting the the stuff out of you know where they fall down in the cushions of chairs. Uh, you know, you couldn't get it all. No, you can't. And, and listen, I can tell you, it, it, it's a great exercise. Our kids, they'd roll their eyes, but the more they'd get involved in it, the more they began, they made a game out of it. But, you know, we could still go in behind them and find things that they missed. You see, when you see how difficult it is to get all the leaven out of our homes, then it begins to hit us, and we begin to realize just how difficult it is to get sin out of our lives. It's easy to find the obvious loaves of bread in the pantry. But if you really, really hunt for the crumbs or the popcorn kernels, that kind of thing, fall between the cushions of the couch, how difficult it is. In the same way, it's easier to get the big and obvious sins out of our life. But it's more difficult to get at those hidden, seemingly small ones. Get them out before they begin to fester. Now, even though we can't, here's the beauty now, even though we can't get all of the sin out of our lives, we have Jesus to cover them all. The blood covers them all. This is why the Feast of Unleavened Bread comes after the feast of the Passover. Do you see it? The blood of the lamb is slain and covers the sin represented in the feast of unleavened bread. Though we should still strive to live in a way that pleases God, still strive to get rid of every known sin, seeking God to reveal anything that's hidden so that we can remove it, even though we still live in a way we should that pleases God. If we believe in Jesus as our Savior, he even forgives the sins we'd rather leave in the dark places or under the fridge, connected to the uh, the uh, compressor. Have you ever looked, uh, you know, under? Uh, think about this: we have a refrigerator with a compressor that sucks in uh, the dust and the dirt, gets accumulated there, the the hair, the dust, and, the, and get in there and clean all of that out. 
even if the home of our life is sparkling clean, chances are we forgot to wipe down the compressor of the refrigerator. And this is why we need Jesus. He's the only one capable of perfectly cleaning the homes of our lives, which allows us to have this relationship and this sweet, wonderful intimacy with the Holy God, the feast of unleavened bread. In Mark 17, or 14, verses 17 through 21, he says, when the evening came, now we're up in the upper room, all right? You've got the connection of these two feasts. I hope you understand them. Any questions, throw them up there. Because like I said, do you see why the context of looking at the cultural context brings to life, you know, the, the wonder and the beauties and the details? That's why I try to give you, you say, well, you roll your eyes, that's history. You know, it doesn't really matter. Well, when you take a look at it, I think, it really matters. Look at verse 17. When it was evening, or when it was evening, he came with the twelve, and they were reclining at the table and eating. And as they're eating, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, here's where we let the cat out of the bag. He does this earlier in John's gospel, doesn't he? But it goes over base by head like this. But here, it's going to hit like a like, uh, 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 wet blanket on a hot day in the midst of uh, uh, the deep south. As they were climbing at a table, eating, Jesus said, Truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. Now, it's just the twelve around the table with him. So he's not, you know, they can look around, but there's nobody else in the corner. It's just them. And they began to be grieved. And say one by one, surely not I. And he, he said to them, it's one of the twelve, one who dips with me in the bowl. For the man, son of man is to go just as it is written. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. They're all lounging around the table in this big room. They're eating. The lamb's been prepared. you got the meal there. They're going through all of the symbolism that belongs to it. And, and, and as we get through, you know, toward somewhere toward the end of the meal, mid-meal or toward the end, uh, he drops the bomb. Around 6 p.m., Jesus and the rest of the disciples arrive and gather at the table. Obviously, Jesus is leading the Passover. And for what we can gather from the other Gospels, it appears that there is a specific seating arrangement. As I shared before, Judas obviously is on one side of Jesus. And we know that John is on the other because he leans, the scripture tells us. How could we be rolling our eyes when you give us such detailed story? Well, because I would tell these stories and get into the details and my kids would go, oh, here we go again. But uh, no, I appreciate the fact that you are all so grateful to, uh, and, and, and you're hungry to learn. That's why this time is so great, precious to me is because there's a hunger in, in all of you and, and, you know, the other 160 some people that are out there, there's a hunger to come back and to learn. And that creates this hunger in me to search out and get as deep and rich in the scriptures I can to give to you. It's, it's a wonderful symbiotic relationship. Uh, according to John 13, uh, this would mean that, that, that Jesus would be, well, he might lean on John and, and lean on Judas. We know he leaned on John. What unfolded now is the drama of the ages. Jesus begins with the first cup of wine, passing it to the disciples, 
and reciting the story of the Exodus, the redemption of Egypt. And uh, then he leads them in a new song uh, of redemption somewhere in either one of the Psalms between Psalm 113 and the Psalm 115, many times beginning. And throughout the evening, they'll sing through all of those Psalms. These songs were sung during the Passover to exalt the redemption of God. But now, Jesus will present them with a mystery that's been hidden through the ages, unveiling it to them now in this specific place. Can you imagine? Whew, can't you imagine? Please, let your sanctified imagination run wild. Can you imagine what it would be like to be there? And here the one who for centuries have been the object of the Passover unveiled the true meaning behind everything and he ought to know because it's all about him. Ever had a class where the professor was the author of the book? I have. It's, it's fascinating. It's fun. But man, here's the author telling the story behind the story. Then he comes to the third cup. He takes it. He blesses it. He breaks the bread. Then he passes it to the disciples who would have eaten it by dipping into bitter herbs and stewed fruit. Now, it's at this point in the meal that Jesus drops this bombshell. Kaboom. And verse 18 says, As they're reclining at the table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who's eating with me. What a horrific moment. Speaking to the twelve, he tells them that one of them eating with them is, is a betrayer and will betray him before the, the night's over. Now talk about a damper at the height of spiritual moment. The disciples are taken back. Man, you're opening the Christmas presents. It's exciting. The paper's flying here and flying there. And, 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 and uh, uh, Grandpa's there and everybody's having a good time. And right in the middle of that, Grandpa says, By the way, I'm dying of cancer. Can you tell me what your home would be like at that point? Sitting around the table, eating the turkey or the prime rib or the ham or whatever it is, everybody joyously dressed, you know, and they're having a great time. It's Christmas. We had a great morning. We opened packages. We've celebrated God. And at the head of the table, Grandpa says, I'm dying. I was called to a scene one time as chaplain is over in West Lynn, and uh, everybody was celebrating Thanksgiving, and it was a celebration. Everybody was having a great and wonderful, beautiful time. They're laughing and joking. The whole family's there. You know, there's 40 people sitting down this long table, Grandma and Grandpa, you know, at either end of the table. Grandpa's been laughing and joking and telling stories, and all of a sudden he goes, <laughs> and plops in face down in the mashed potatoes. True story, people. Well, they began to be grieved, it says. And say to him, surely not I. Do you get the picture of the scene from joy to unspeakable grief. You could hear them turning to each other in shock. Who would do such a thing? Unthinkable, inconceivable, unbelievable. And Jesus goes on further in verse 20, and he said to them, it's one of the twelve. It's one of the twelve who will dip with me in the bowl. Then with bread in his hand, he reaches out and he dips into the bowl bitter herbs or sweet fruit. And simultaneously, at the same time, while, he's, he, while it's happening, probably without the Judas's hand follows and 
it still went right over the heads of the disciples. And we know from other scripture that Judas struggled with greed. And John tells us that he had pilfered from the ministry accounts throughout his tenure with them. And while people were donating to Jesus' ministry, G Judas was, was removing, he was skimming from the money box unknown for most of the time to the disciples. This was a man who was, had an adding machine in his mind who instantly could calculate the price of Mary's ointment and he was stealing from the apostles' funds. That's in part why got, it, it, he got so upset with Mary's anointing Jesus. For Judas was the other, and the other men in the room, you know, he inspired, you know, that, that, that twisted concept that they were just simply wasting funds. But this came from the very heart of Judas. When Jesus made the announcement of betrayal, John tells us that the disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which one of them he meant. None suspected Judas, and unknown to the disciples for about a week, Judas had been seeking out how to, well, for, for four days, seeking out how to betray Jesus, and he's already paid 30 pieces of silver for the job. John's Gospel, in chapter 13, verse 22, tells us uh, that they were deeply, deeply confused. Uh, let me move that up there. The disciples began looking at each other at a loss to know which one he was speaking. But Judas, ever the cool one, he mouthed and said, Oh, surely don't I. Sounded just like Peter, just like John. Just like James. Just like one of the crowd. Not I. Surely. I think if Peter had understood what was transpiring, Judas most likely would have did a man dead, been a dead man on the spot. I mean, that's kind of fiery temper that Peter had. Remember what happens in the garden a few hours later. Thwack, and off comes Matthias's ear. Yet, knowing that Judas was the traitor, Jesus still reaches out to him. And according to John 13, following supper, he washes the disciples' feet. That would include Judas. While telling them that there's one in their midst that's not clean. You know what's weird? Knowing that Jesus is going to betray him for 30 pieces of silver, Jesus still places him in a seat of honor right next to him. Sitting so close to Jesus that he could whisper to him in his ear where no one could hear, he could reach out at the same location and dip in the same cup. And John tells us as soon as Judas took the bread and dipped it in, bitter, uh, in, 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 the, in the bitter herbs that Satan entered into him and took control of Judas. This was not demon possession. This was Satan possession. Look at chapter 13 of John, verse 27. And Satan then entered into him. Satan was used used Judas's greed to gain control of him. And no matter the fact that he had walked and talked with Jesus, his greed blinded him to the message of the gospel of the kingdom and opened the door for Satan to fully possess and control him. He didn't believe, or else that could have never happened. We know that he didn't because Jesus said there's one with us that doesn't believe. So there he is. He had refused to repent and over the years his greed got deeper and deeper and deeper. Every time he stole he had an opportunity to repent. 
Every time he skimmed, he had an opportunity. There, there had to be this conviction there, but he ignored it. And like Pharaoh, he hardened his heart, he hardened his heart, he hardened his heart, until there came a point that he could no longer change God, hardened his heart. And at that point, it's just a matter. At that point, in this case, Satan literally opens, enters in, and takes possession. Now, we'll pick this up on Monday and right here, and we're going to flesh this out more. And we're going to, you know, to continue to look at this developing drama. But I think you've got enough to think about and ponder about for the next few days. As God works out his purposes in your life. By the way, I'm going to share with you that long post that is out here. I've always told people, be very cautious to these sorts of things. This is almost identical to others that we've got by wording. Just a couple of things tweaked and changed. Do not call the phone numbers and do not uh, put yourself open to being scammed. All right? Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for the attentiveness and the alertness of your people. I thank you, Lord, so much for the presence and the residence of the Holy Spirit to give us wisdom and give us understanding. To pull back certain layers, Lord, that we can look more deeply into the, the cultural impact and of, of what's being said and what's being done. And that, Lord, we can see that, that even though this is in a culture 2,000 years ago, maybe foreign to us, the principles that are here, that are practiced and taught, are just as applicable in our life and in our homes as they were then. So, God, let us celebrate you. And I pray, Lord, that you will use each and every one of us today to magnify your glory. And you are a glorious, glorious God. Thank you. Bless us and make our going out and our coming in an act of worship. And everything in between, no matter what it is that we practice today, let us practice your presence in the midst of it. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' blessed name, Amen and amen. God bless you. I love you all. It is a joy to be with you. Thank you for your prayers in advance. And we are faithing in advance, believing in advance. All's going to go smoothly and God's going to be glorified. May God bless you. Have a great time. We'll be around. Uh, so, And even if I'm out of town, you need something, you email, you call, you text. I am never out of touch. Come up. You know, so don't let something you know, hang. And if something needs to be taken care of here, I got people that can take care of that. May God bless you. Have a great, great day. And I'll see you tonight at 6 and again at 9 in the morning, but I'll be back live with you on Monday. May God bless you. Pray for Rick as he preaches on Sunday. God bless you all.